Welcome back to the Jet Rail Podcast. I'm your host, Jill Therese, and I'm also late. It's fine. Um, late in the sense that this podcast is not on time. Not pregnant. Don't don't be scared or dead. That word means a lot of things. Um, before I get too deep down this rabbit hole, I'm going to go ahead and start the podcast, if that's all right with you guys. All right, let's roll the intro music. Alrighty guys, hey hi, hello, how we doing? Before we jump into it, you know the drill, we gotta do some sponsors so that I can eat. Okay, three, two, one, go. Alright, now that that is out of the way guys, I have said guys a lot, um, but today I wanted to, actually yesterday, I wanted to talk about uh, a lot of things, however, um, you know, things don't always go according to plan. And I had a lot of homework that I had to do last night, um, so uh, I opted to do that instead of the podcast, which kind of blows like a lot of it, um, but it's okay because I got it done. I still have so much to do today, but, um, you know, uh, it was it was mandatory, and then this just didn't happen, but I ended up staying up until 3 a.m. anyway because I couldn't sleep. And I was absolutely miserable, so then um, I tried to wake up at 6.30 to record this before the 8 a.m., you know, when I like for it to go up. Couldn't get up. I was so exhausted. I haven't gotten a whole lot of sleep this week anyway. Um, And then, so, then I had to run to the vet to go get my cat and go pick up a prescription. And then when I got back, I just absolutely crashed for like an hour and or two. I don't know. (laughs) It's been a while. Um, But I'm going to try very very hard this week to get my sleep schedule back on track because I am like really over this <laughs> um not being able to do anything during the day kind of thing and also it's about to be summer summer and I cannot ride at 1 p.m because it is too hot here I have to get up at like 7 so we're fixing the sleep schedule effective fucking immediately okay um anyway so this podcast is titled I believe um Zoe's Hawk Update and The ethics of maintenance and competition. That took me a hot second, but I got there. Um, Okay, so first, I want to talk about how is Zoe? She got her hawks done last week. You guys know this. You were present. I discussed it a little bit last week. A lot of bit. I'm so yawny. I just woke up, literally. Um, But, um, again. (laughs) And, uh, anyway, so she got her hawks done, and... um, I actually had tried to record this episode on the way to the vet, but it just, it wasn't working, um, because I was too distracted. I can't handle, (laughs) I can't handle that. Um, but, uh, uh, in doing so when I was waiting, because you know, you have to wait outside for everything these days, I had to wait outside on my kitty cat, Mr. Archibald. And, um, as I was doing so, I was like reviewing the video of me riding Zoe from Sunday, because I rode her two days ago. Hi. We all over the place story tell. I hear it's good for my ADHD buddies. I don't know if it's good for the normies, but the people that brains work like mine, they're like, yeah, this is great. (laughs) You think just like I do. Um, Anyway, uh, case and point. um, But, okay, what was I talking about? Um, So two days ago, I rode her. Um, You know, it had been, I think she got injected on Saturday, and then I waited until the next Sunday to ride her, so six or yeah about six days um so I rode her and um I didn't think like it it felt infinitely better but it's really hard to tell because she's still so tight in her back and shoulder um and like her hip area but in watching the video her hawks are night and day difference like she is reaching under herself and um it's much more fluid and relaxed um but it was hard for me to tell because I, you know I'm sitting directly on her back I can feel her back being so tight and jolty but um the difference is is huge um so that was definitely a good call for her um so I'm really excited about that now it's just a matter of everything that is to follow <laughs> so um yeah, so I, I wrote her, and she, like, I don't know. It's just, it is really disheartening. I mean, not really. I mean, I wasn't surprised. Say I mean one more time, Jill. Um, <laughs> I I expected that the, 
what I used to call hotness or sassiness, which, you know, anxiety is what it is. Um, I, I expected it to be there, but I was really, really hoping that um, once her hawks were done and, you know, she picked up a canner, she'd be, like, stressed. And then she'd be like, wait, it feels good. And then everything would just click and we would be on our happy, merry way. Um, but that's the thing about, you know, training and horses and memory <clears throat> is that, uh, you know, if I've been riding her for a few years with her hawks causing her problems, or if she's been existing, I haven't ridden really the past two years, but if she's been existing in hawk pain, um, she's going to expect it. Um, so, you know, uh, assuming that we're clear in all other regards, um, it would be a matter of, um, reteaching because now the behavior that was initially a defense and also a like blinking red flag, like, Hey, I don't feel good. Um, you know, she's trying to tell me something and also protect herself and, um, compensate now it's turned into a learned behavior, so now that's just how she goes, um, so we will have to work on untraining that, but um, that is only assuming um, that everything else is fine. Um, I would like to send the video to my vet and be like, hey, what you think, dog? And um, I will probably do that in the coming days. My cats, I swear, they haven't been racing each other like all week until I start recording so I hope it's not too distracting but uh anyway that is that um she's doing a lot better and now it's just a matter of um where I go from here you know what direction I want to take um I think until I can get a chiropractor and or body worker out here or preferably both um I'm probably just gonna like stay off of her um, cause she, she was very, very counter, oh my God, all the body sounds very, very counter flexed to the left when I'm going right. Um, so she's got her head or her nose pointing left around a right circle for those of you who don't know what counter flexion is. Um, and so I think she's probably out in her uh, neck or shoulder or something, which makes sense. I mean, it's been a while since she's been adjusted um, because our chiropractor moved away. So now I have to try and find one. I've asked around a little bit, but I haven't really yielded anything promising. But I'm just going to have to take a swing and hope. <sighs> hope for the best. Burping, yawning, and cats. This is really a very professional podcast. I'm so sorry. Um, I'll try try my best to make that stop. Um, anyway, she, that's, that's where we're at with Zoe. She is doing much better and that is the update. And I just, I really want to get somebody to, you know, help her loosen up and feel really good so that, um, when I'm on her, things will also feel really good, you know, and that way we can start untraining those, um, stress responses because there ain't no way in hell that I'm going to be able to ride that horse if she is uncomfortable anywhere. So I would just like to rule that out before I start just trying to fix it with training um, because it won't work and it'll be a waste of both of our times. So that is that. But um, I also wanted to jump in and talk about um, my views, um, like my ethical principles, I guess you could say, uh, regarding, um, you know, maintenance on your horse. So um, and I use the uh, word maintenance operatively as, um, like, when you have to do injections and things like that to keep the horse uh, going and feeling good uh, artificially. So, um, yeah, this this conversation was, um, you know, inspired <laughs> on uh, Twitter. I, I tweeted this. And you can follow me at Jet Equa Theory if you would like to see this when it's happening. I tweeted um, <clears throat> in true Twitter form, why are we out here justifying running horses with so much maintenance? Competition is so hard on them and past a certain point it's just shortening the comfortable happy years left when they do eventually give out because they'll be sore and arthritic. Some horses really enjoy competing but it's not a disservice to retire them to light work before they're completely unable. Ability doesn't equal need. You can still jump around without running upper levels, you know? Not saying maintenance isn't a normal part of existing. I mean, at this point, we all need chiro and probs of injections, but I'm talking about staying in hard work. 
I don't know, even with Zoe, it stresses me out doing her hawks like we're never eventing again. That's obviously not the move for everyone, but I just cannot stomach risking making it worse on her. I hope to do some light jumping, but as far as running training again, I don't think so. Uh, I think Zoe gave some amazing years that I wouldn't trade for the world. The least I can do is respect or give her the respect for her body and insist on and not insist. I can't read and not insist on breaking her down because she's an ex ex cross country machine. I don't have to read the abbreviation. (laughs) Yes, she's talented, but I refuse to play another role in wearing down her body. uh, Like it seems very simple to me. Why is a damn ribbon so important? So obviously it's a little it's a little uh, twittery, (laughs) if you will. Um, but it gets the point across. It's not really, I just realized reading that, like how that is not how I talk on the podcast at all. Um, but it's more, I don't know. Typing is always different. Oh my God. I'm so tired of fucking yelling. Um, anyway, so that's my point. You know, I just, I, I get it. Like, obviously those that compete love competing otherwise they wouldn't be competing it's very fun especially eventing eventing for me was just like the one weekend or two weekends out of the month that I just like really looked forward to I got to forget about homework and school and people and just focus on being with my horse and being a competitor and um you know memorizing the courses and getting just so lost in all of that and it was it was an escape but it was also like you know, just another world. It's just super nice to be a part of that. Um, but obviously it comes with all of its drawbacks. You know, I have, um, problems ethically with a lot of the training, um, that's done to get to that point, but that is not what this episode is about. You can go listen to literally any other episode of the podcast for that. Um, but as far as, um, in regards to maintenance, um, I just, I have a really hard time now at this point in my life. I have done it before, but, um, where I'm at now, because we are always evolving and changing and people are allowed to grow and decide that they believe something different from what they believed when they were 14. Um, and as a 21 coming 22 year old, um, my beliefs are a little bit different. And I think that, um, if your horse is starting to need a lot of maintenance, it's probably time to retire them. Because in my opinion, like, especially with stuff like Hawks, like, eventually those bitches are going to (laughs) fuse. And, um, you know, I'm not a vet and I don't know too much. Um, but I just, I cannot justify, um, like breaking them down faster for my own gain. Like, you know, I mean, obviously I did it to begin with. Uh, I mean, if Zoe was chilling in a pasture for her entire life, you know, that probably wouldn't have happened. Um, it's not to say I regret, you know, riding her. I, I mean, I think we both had a blast for a lot of that. Um, but also not really because that's when I pulled her out of eventing anyway. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I think that, um, you know, deciding that you're just going to keep injecting and injecting and injecting and injecting, Um, And I'm not talking about like, oh, he needed a little boost here. Like, I mean, sure, fine. But like when it it becomes regular or you start talking about like nerving, which by the way, so sorry if you disagree with me, I don't give a shit. Nerving is gross for any other reason other than to keep them pasture sound. So like if the horse is totally fine and it's not going to like, you know, make things worse to do it, cool. Have them live out the rest of their days. But to nerving to just keep like jumping and especially showing it like a high level like what the fuck dude that's sick like oh god that i just no I, I do not agree with that one bit at all um and correct me if i'm wrong but that's my understanding of nerving uh but like gross <laughs> don't do that um like there's so many horses out there dude you don't have to just like keep pushing one until you break its foot off um Anyway, uh, that is the one thing that I will just forever be like, are you kidding? Um, anyway, furthermore on the maintenance, like I just, I just, I really think that when you start having to inject pretty frequently, it's probably time to like, you know, at least reevaluate and be like, okay, like, is it worth it anymore? You know, should I back off the training or should I, you know... I don't know. I don't know how else to say it other than just like continue to wear your horse down until it breaks. Like it just, I don't know. It seems very selfish to me. 
And the thing is, like, I know when I had um, my little 15-2 Morgan Dragonfly, he was, like, I think he was 14 or 15, and he needed Hawk injections. And um, I think we did it, like, two or three times. And um, it never crossed my mind. I was never like, yep, I'd rather compete than, uh, you know, preserve the longevity of my horse. It was never, like, a decision like that. And I feel like most people, that's that's not on the forefront of their mind, especially young people. Because, I mean, I was, like, 12 or 13. And, you know, my vet didn't say to me, would you, you know, this could potentially wear your horse down a little bit more. Um, you know, if you keep going, cause he's already showing signs of, you know, some arthritic changes, blah, blah, blah. Nobody said that to me. They were like, yeah, he's a little arthritic. Let's just inject it and then you'll be good to go. And I was like, lit, <laughs> fix that. Um, so, you know, it, I don't know. It just, that's, that's just the way of the horse world, I guess. But, um, to me, uh, and maybe I'm too much of a tree hugger and whatever, but to me, I would rather, um, inject to keep my animal happy and keep her feeling good and then do everything I can to keep her going without, um, you know, contributing to the wear and tear. And that doesn't mean that I'll never ride Zoe again or I'll never jump Zoe again. I would love to get back to doing that, but it would be very minimal. You know, I'm not going to be, you know, drilling flat work every single day of the week. And, uh, maybe one day, one or two days out of that week, I'm doing, um, show jump or cross country schooling and, you know, jumping like three foot regularly and running cross country. Um, so, you know, it's just backing it off, I think. Um, because I just, I just, ah, blah, 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 stuttering. I just, I really have a hard time now with where I stand and how I view riding and horses. Um, I have a really hard time being like, yeah, inject and then keep going. And if they wear down more, inject again and blah, blah, blah. Um, it just, it seems really selfish. And, um, at least from my perspective, it's a case of, um, putting competition above the horse, even if it's unconscious, you know, I mean, like I said, when I was younger, I had no idea. And that's, that's just what I did. I loved my horse and I loved competing. So I was like, here we go. Inject. Duh. But now I'm kind of like, mm let's, let's reevaluate what it means when you're having to inject and, um, you know, continuing to run training level and upper levels and, um, do really intense, hard, demanding impact sports. It's going to wear the horse down. And I just, I don't get why you have to wait until the horse is completely unable to work to retire them. And I know a lot of people who are doing this and a lot of people who are like, but they love jumping. I could never take it away from them. And I'm like, dude, I love you to death. And I know you love your horse. And I know you're trying to justify continuing to compete it, but it's a fucking horse. Okay. It, it doesn't need to jump. It's not going to sit in its pasture depressed if it's not jumping. It will sit in its pasture depressed if it's not getting any you know, stimulation. If it's sitting in a dry lot, just chilling, of course it's going to be depressed. But if it has buddies, a big paddock to roam around in, food available, water, shelter, that horse is not going to give one shit. Um, because it's a horse and we really, really like to anthropomorphize. I hope that that's the correct way to make that a verb. Um, we really like to make it, you know, the horses like people, but it's, it's doing that as a justification for what we want. And, um, don't get me wrong. I've done it my entire life and I still do it. Um, it's, I try to pay really close attention to when I do do it, but to say that the horse needs to jump or, um, you know, despite, you know, all the issues that it's having, like, um, you know, like arthritic hocks or ankles or back, like kissing spine, stuff like that. Like, the horse doesn't need to keep jumping. He does not. You can do so many other things with your horse. Jumping and eventing and, or even running barrels and stuff like that, that's really intense on their bodies is not necessary. It's just not. And the horse is not going to not live a quality life if it can't do that. What are you planning on doing when the horse retires? Are you just going to stick it out in a field? I hope not. <laughs> um, I mean, that's what a lot of people do. I mean, hell, we have, yeah, I don't know, 15 horses on our quote-unquote back 40 
that just sit there. And I don't have time to interact with every single horse out here. And it, it sucks. I hate it. But like with Zoe, you know, I mean, she is my heart horse. I made a, you know, a, I guess, pact oath. I dedicated myself to her and I pledged when I bought her that I would take care of her. And taking care of her to me means that stopping before damage is, bit, you know, before I continue the damage. Because, I mean, obviously, eventing her played a role in <laughs> making her a little bit arthritic. I mean, that eventing did a lot to her body. There were a few soundness issues that we had throughout the time. And she even had to go through colic surgery because she st- was stressed out. Um, so, I mean, like, I, I'm just to the point where I am like, I want to play as positive a role in her life as I can instead of like, "Mm, what can I get away with? And I like, again, please do not, if you are competing a horse that requires maintenance, do not think I'm sitting here shitting on you being like, you, you just, how dare you do that to your horse? You're such an awful owner. Most people don't even think about it. It's not a conscious thought. It's just what everybody does. So you keep doing it and you haven't even questioned if it's wrong or not, or if it's what you want to do or not, you know? So, you know, I mean, with Zoe, I don't feel like some big noble martyr, but obviously I would really love to get back to eventing on her. It was so much fun when it was good. Um, but, but it's just, it's not good for her. She did not have a good time there at the end. It was not going well. She was very stressed. And I think the only way that I could get her to really enjoy eventing would be to just force her to deal with it. And, um, that's not something I'm interested in doing. I think that if I, really wanted to dedicate my time to, you know, positive reinforcement, I might be able to get her competing, but it would take years, like years to undo everything I did. I think a horse that you bring from the ground up, it would be much easier, but Zoe would have so much to undo. And, um, I just, I cannot, can't, can't, I, it's just not worth it. You know, I don't need to compete that badly to where I just have to retrain everything. And also it's always going to be changing and dynamic. And honestly, at this point, I think it's a little bit wishful thinking. If I had every day of every week, you know, 24 hours a day to spend working on this, it would probably work. But the reality is I don't, and nor do I really want to. And especially since, um, you know, we're dealing with some arthritic changes and some hot compression like it's it's not worth it like why why am I trying to force something that um you know she's already told me is too much and um you know and her body is like all right we did our time and now we're done and now it's time to do something else and you know that's the thing too like I feel like people assume that when you're done with um you know, competing and training and whatever, then that's, that's it. You come out maybe once a month, you pull the horse out of the pasture and you do a a light flat ride or go hack in the woods or something. And, um, you know, that's, that's retirement. Um, that's life after the, um, the competing. And to me, that's, that's sad because if that's all the horse can do physically, that probably means that it competed too long and it got broken down um, to the point where it, it was impossible to do anything else. So what I'm suggesting is that, you know, and, and I know that for most people I'm doing it too early for Zoe, but I also already have reasons for wanting to stop competing anyway. So, um, well on her. So it's, I mean, I'm stopping earlier than I think most would and or should. I think, I think you could justify continue going a little bit longer, but I just, it's not worth it to me. Um, so what I'm suggesting is that once you start noticing some, um, you know, arthritic changes or, um, like just anything in their body that's starting to become a problem, like their spines fusing together or their hocks or ankles, you know, any, any sort of arthritic changes, (laughs) um, then it just like ease off, you know, before the horse is done. You know, let them have a life after competing instead of just being thrown out in a pasture semi-lame. What I think would be the best thing to do is like, you know, compete for a few years. And then once, you know, the horse's body is kind of like, all right, also while you're doing it, maybe take some preventative measures because I did not, I didn't even think about it. Uh, There's just, and you know, I can't even fault myself or anybody else for this because it's, there's so much to think about all the time with horses. 
everything is so much all the time <laughs> and it's just you're gonna miss stuff and um that is definitely something that I learned my lesson on um join supplements before the issue happens um you know some preventative measures to make sure that their body has the supplies to keep it going um but yeah I don't know I just I think um after you know you start seeing signs of wear and tear then it's time to change gears it doesn't mean you're done with your horse it doesn't mean you have to sell it to a small child that it can you know run the lower levels with or anything like that what you can do is just do something else with your horse i mean i get it if you want to keep competing it's that's a really hard cookie to crumble <laughs> swallow i don't pill to swallow I'm mixing my metaphors here or idioms i guess um but for me it's it's not about you know, competing. And I know everybody's different because for a while it was about competing for me because I bought and sold horses left and right because it was about competing. Now it's about my horse and it's about Zoe. And I don't think that one is necessarily more noble than the other. It's just a matter of where you're at and what you want. And for me, I, I want Zoe at this juncture, which is just something that I question every single day. I'm like, I have this crazy fucking horse that is so difficult for me to deal with all the time. It's never easy. And I, it's, it's not what I want at all. I would like to just be able to go enjoy it, but it's, it's a constant, what is wrong now? How do I fix this? How can I be better? Blah, 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 which arguably makes me a better rider, but why am I trying to be a better rider? <laughs> it's fine. But I've made my decision regardless of all of the, the drawbacks, but I love Zoe with all my heart and I could not imagine having a different horse. She is my heart horse through and through. And, um, so, you know, it's not about competing. It, like after she had colic surgery and I took a hard look at what we were doing because I mean, she did not colic because her feed was different or the weather or anything like that. It's because of the anxiety that she was living in and ulcers and just got stressed and colic. And so, you know, it's, it's just not, ugh, made me sad. Um, so I had to take a hard look at what we were doing and I was like, all right, that's it. I'm going to, I'm going to switch gears. And that doesn't mean that if you back off, you have to switch to positive reinforcement or anything like that. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. All I'm saying is like, you can do other things with your horse other than just compete. And, um, you know, for some people you can just get another horse and then have this one to hack around on. Um, for me, what it looks like is I am, uh, trick training. Uh, that's something that I really want to um, use my time this summer to get into a little bit more is do some fun, fun tricks and, um, work along those lines. And, um, I want to improve our under saddle, um, work and get her to a point where she's comfortable in all three gates and can self-regulate self-carriage and, um, is just comfortable and happy and not stressed and trying to run faster all the time. Um, to where she's comfortable moving off my leg and, um, I'd like to work towards bridalists and I'd like to be able to go on trail rides and hacks and stuff. Hacks? Where are you from, Jill? Hacks and stuff. <laughs> um, you know, just a different change of pace. Yes, it's more low key and it's not as adrenaline junky as eventing is, but it's still fun. It's still a brain puzzle for both of us. We both have to think and use our brains and participate together. And arguably it's more bonding than competing because competing, I mean, let's be real. Most of us go out to the barn, get the horse out, brush, groom, tack up, get on, ride for, I don't know, 20 to an hour, um, get off, untack, hose it off, put it in a stall, and maybe you give it a few carrots or like pet it for a few minutes. But like most people aren't like hanging out with their horses for hours while they're, um, you know, in competition season because most other people have lives and things to do. But could you imagine if you spent all that time just like grooming your horse or hanging out with them or scratching them or playing with them, um, you know, teaching them tricks where they get to earn treats, like, mm, obviously one's going to make the horse like you a little bit better. You know, uh, it's, it, it just, it bonds you. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with a relationship that is strictly, you know, business like that. Um, even if you are giving them carrots and whatnot, but like, it's, it's not, a far reach of the imagination to, um, see that <laughs> it's, it's more bonding when you do things that the, the horse likes to do naturally. I mean, like, let's, let me think of an example. Like if you, um, say you're a kid's karate teacher. Okay. 
Um, and it's not weird <laughs> that you're a kid's karate teacher. And every time the kid comes into the session, you are drilling and drilling and drilling. And at the end, you give him a sucker or something. Like, cool. The kid's like, all right, I'm here to learn the end. Um, but, you know, maybe one day you guys just, you're, or you say, what do you want to do today? We don't have to work super hard. It's just whatever you would like to do. Maybe we could learn a new skill or something. I'm sure the kid would be like, hell yeah, let's do that instead of drilling and training all the time. You know, it's a, I, I'm comparing it to a kid because I feel like ponies are, are kids. So <laughs> it makes sense. Um, but um, or maybe even like if you were at work and, you know, you're you work a computer job or something and your boss is drilling you and making you um, do all of the tasks that you do every single day. And they're like, OK. You know, work a little harder and uh, maybe you'll get a raise at the end of the day. And you're like, all right, lit. <laughs> and um, that day is not going to be as rewarding or make you like your boss as much as if your boss was like, what do you want to do today? Like, you still need to be in office, but like, what do you want to do? You know, and you get to pick. You get to do what you want. Um, like, it's obviously not a perfect parallel, but it's something to think about, you know. And I'm not shitting on competition or anything like that. It's just... I think that the relationship needs a balance for sure if you're going to be competing and stuff. Um, because, oh God, sorry, I bumped the mic. Um, if you're competing, especially with like eventing, you have to trust your horse and you have to know that horse inside and out and be bonded to it and actually listen to it instead of, um, you know, write a narrative. I see so many people who take their horse just to shows or, you know, just have them in the barn and the horse is pinning its ears kicking, biting at people when they walk by and they're like, he's just grouchy. That's just him. Like, he's just a dick. Like, dude, <laughs> what do you mean? Like that? Oh, that blows my mind. I'm like, can you not see that this horse has a problem? Like people just are so quick to write it off. You know what it is? It's the fundamental attribution error. It's when, you know, like if you were acting bitchy to someone uh, you would know that that's not who you are. That's not your personality. That's not your character. You're just having a bad day. The environment is affecting you. You've had, you know, to go get your cat from the vet and you've had to not get enough sleep. Um, you know, and that's why you're in a bad mood. But other people will look at you and this is the fundamental attribution error. They'll be like, that girl is a bitch. She is so grouchy. What a bad personality. I don't like her. And that's what we do to our horses because when we're having a bad day, we know that that's not who we are. It's just a bad day. But when the horse acts like that, that's just who they are. And that irritates the dog schnot out of me because that's what I used to do too. I had Bo. Bo did those things where he would bite out at people and pin his ears every time somebody walked past him. That horse did not like people. And do you know why? Because people were mean to him and made him do things that he didn't want to do when he was uncomfortable. Um, cause I mean, for like the first three months I owned him, he had a keratoma that we didn't know about. And, you know, my trainers told me that, um, he was just being a jerk and I needed to kick him on. And I was convinced something was wrong. My father will vouch to this day because he was the only other person that believed me. And he was like, there's something wrong with that horse. That's not how he goes. And, um, everybody else, my trainers were both like, no, like the horse is just a dick. You just need to kick him on. Then we got x-rays. Mm, he had a tumor in his foot. I don't always like being right, but, uh, in that case I was like, thank God it's not my horse. But you know, he never really recovered, um, attitude wise because I didn't know how to form a bond with him. I thought if I just like went out and petted him for a little bit, I was like bond. And, or if I like took his bridle off and rode him around a paddock as we like zigzagged cause I couldn't steer, um, that that was a bond. It's not, Hey, <laughs> um, use your brain, Jill. And, um, so I don't know. I just, I think I've, really rabbit hold here. didn't mean to do that. Um, but it, it makes a big difference when you take the time to really look at the horse and look past your own guilt and your own desires and selfishness, which is not easy to do because not all of us are aware of it. I wasn't for a very long time and, um, look at it, the situation and be like, this is what it is. You know, this horse is not happy. I need to change something. And that's all you have to do. Like, I think people are so scared of changing something because they think that they might have to give up something they want to do, heaven forbid, um, to make the horse's life better. You know, it's a horse. It has to deal with it. It's still livestock in America. So, you know, it does what I want. 
not what it wants. And it'll rule me or it'll run my life. Um, I have to assert my dominance. You know, stuff like that is just, it perpetuates that selfishness. And I promise you, if you let the horse have a say, it's not going to take away your power. You know, little ego man. <laughs> um, was it Caesar Milan? Is that who it is? Um, the dog trainer that's like <laughs> all the time with the dogs. Oh, that man is whack. There are plenty of videos out there that you can watch that like disprove his theory and whatnot um, by lots of vets. Um, anyway, um, so that's the, all of that to say that I think that it's worth <clears throat> taking a really hard look at your horse. Um, also on the, um, I think I touched on this a bit um, in my last episode, you know, behaviorally, like I was just labeling Zoe, you know, not as a dick or because she was pinning her ears and biting at people, but I labeled her as sassy or hot because she um, is really tight to ride. She, um, sorry for the innuendo, everyone. Um, she just is so tight in her back and, um, you know, swishes her tail and tucks her nose in and she just acts like she is a bottle rocket about to explode. And for years I was like, she's just hot. Like, that's just how she goes. Um, you know, but no, nope, she was uncomfortable. And, uh, that was very obvious to, I think everyone, but nobody wanted to say so because it because the the theory that blocks it is the dominance theory you know people you can't look at the horse and say oh it's doing this because you know it's uncomfortable or it's in pain because your first thought is no i have to make the horse do what i want otherwise it's going to um usurp me and uh that's why i think that that's a really toxic mentality to have because if you are working with your horse in a partnership and you're allowing the horse to say yes or no, um, when the horse says no, you are like, oh, what's wrong? Instead of no horse, you're doing what I say. Like, let's not have a dictatorship, my friends. Um, but anyway, all that to say, you can do more with your horse than just uh, compete and train and train and train and train and train. There's so many other things. And if you're like a diehard trainer and you just really like working on things, you can pick endless endless things to train. Um, you can even challenge yourself to learn a new way to train like I did with uh, positive reinforcement. Um, you know, I wanted to train Zoe how to do some tricks and stuff. Positive reinforcement is the easiest and most effective way to do so. And um, I have a lot of things that I still am like really, really excited to work on teaching her and um we have so much left to do you know just because I'm not competing doesn't mean I'm not interacting with her all the time and have you know goals and things that I want um and I don't have to give any of them up because she's so game for them it's just the issue right now is riding because I want her to be sound in case I ask her to do any like walk trot canter things on the ground I don't want her to be in pain um so right now I'm trying to just like uh ride to sort out where the problems are um, and then we are going to go back and, um, untrain all of the badness after she feels better, if that makes sense. So that's where I'm at with all of that. Um, and I just hope that, um, that that makes sense because like, there's just, there's in, in endless amounts of things that you can do. You can do trick training. You can do trail riding. You can keep in light flat work. You can still jump, you know, for, in most cases. It's just a matter of backing it off to where it's not this huge ordeal, you know, where you're training, 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 drilling, 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 running prelim intermediate training. Like, just chill out. Maybe move the horse back down a level and um, just enjoy the sport instead of being so competitive. Or you can try and win, you know? Um, try and win at the lower levels with your horse um, before you, you know, take away competing entirely. And then you can start working on, because most arena horses are not confident on trails because it's a whole new world. <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed that. I didn't, and I'm cringing so hard right now. I'm so sorry I did that, but it, it happens. Um, but horses that are, you know, generally arena horses get their minds blown on trails, especially Zoe. Oh my God. She did not appreciate that. Um, so, uh, you know, it's something th that you can work on and get them confident and excited and used to doing things like that. I mean, there's there's a whole world of things you can work on with your horse that is not competing. Um, 
so yeah um hmm what else um young horses you know that's another thing um preventing um preventing the need to um inject and whatnot sorry i'm really I'm petting my cat and i'm not paying attention <laughs> um but you know the age that you start the horse at and how much work you put them in when you do start has a huge impact on their longevity like if you start you know a two-year-old in extreme work horses probably is not going to last super long it's if you build them up slowly and start a little bit later and um you know work for quality and not you know speed then um the horse is going to last a lot longer. I mean, obviously you have genetic variables and like, you know, some horses have soft tissue issues, um, soft tissue issues. (laughs) Um, but outside of those variables, generally speaking, um, slow and steady wins the race. Um, so beyond that for prevention, there are supplements out there. I've been doing a lot of research, so I don't really want to speak on it just yet before I decide what I'm going to do. Um, I think, the best one that I have seen so far, and I, again, haven't done enough research to really speak on this, but somebody sent me a flow chart of um, the feed-through supplements, and the ActiveFlex 4000, the price per dose is $0.66 cents per ounce, and it has the highest amounts of chondriatin, the hydro- hyaluronic acid, and perna canaliculis. This is why I'm not a biology major. And it also has MSM and glucosamine. It doesn't have the highest amounts, but it does have those in there. It seems like the best way to go. Um, So I'm going to look into that um, as far as prevention goes um, for supplements. And, um, you know, other things you can do are warm your horse up properly instead of just going out. I'm guilty of it, too. I like to go out and be warmed up in five minutes. And no, you need to take it slow, walk, really get the horse moving and swinging and loosen their back before you get... Uh, working up to trot and then really into your like lateral work or whatever you're doing. Um, and then a cool out to let their body really cool down instead of just like going back to stand in a stall for an hour after they've worked, you know? So, um, those are all different things you can do. Some food for thought. Um, again, I really hope that I didn't offend anybody. I'm just very tired of tiptoeing around (laughs) things. So I am speaking my mind, take it or leave it. Um, I hope that you all, enjoyed it and it was at least somewhat entertaining even if it made you growl at me a few times um but that said you can find me at jet equithery j-e-t-e-q-u-i-t-h-e-o-r-y um you can find me at jetequithery.com or the same username on instagram twitter facebook youtube and um i also have a personal instagram jill.trees that you should follow and an Instagram for this podcast, Jet Real Podcast. Um, post lots of updates and things on that regarding the podcast. And um, a post every time one goes live, in case you forget. But I come out with the new episodes every single Tuesday. And uh, so, with that said, I will see you guys next Tuesday. Goodbye! Goodbye!